Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the First Congregational Church of Langsburg's online service. Thank you for joining with us here in this digital space. My name is Chris, and I'll be your host for today. You can check in and let us know you're here by saying hello in the comments below. You can also share anything we need to hold space for there, and our community will remember you in our prayers. Today is the eighth and final Sunday of Epiphany, which is Transfiguration Sunday. Malcolm Geit says, I believe the glimpse of glory in Christ they saw on the Mount of the Transfiguration was given in order to sustain the disciples through darkness that would lead to Good Friday. So this story is a great doorway into the season of Lent, which starts next week. And as we explore, we have a few poems, prayers, and readings for us along the way. Blessings on your journey. Good morning, everyone. This is Terry. I'm reading Psalm 99, retold by Malcolm Geit. With every gift that grateful hearts can bring, we celebrate the glory of the one who sits between the cherubim. We sing a song of love and judgment met in one. Mercy meets righteousness and truth meets grace. Made one in Christ as in him we are one. The world may waver, we'll delight to trace the long line of his loving and to name the holy ones who see him face to face. Moses and Aaron, whom he has called home and Samuel, but I shall name each priest within my heritage who looked to him. John Dunn and Herbert Hopkins, each a priest, as much of language as of sacrament. Love bids us welcome with them to the feast. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. We light this candle to remind us that Christ is the light of the world and was born as a human being to dispel the darkness of our hearts and minds. We light this candle to remind us that Christ is God's love revealed perfectly, knowing no boundaries or limits and calling us the beloved of God. Good morning all and welcome to the eighth and final Sunday in Epiphany, the season dedicated to exploring the revelation to the whole world that Jesus is the Son of God. Today is Transfiguration Sunday and it's one of the most important yet overlooked Sundays on the church calendar, right up there with like Ascension Sunday and Pentecost. We cover the major event in Christ's life where he climbs up a mountain with three of his closest disciples and he's raised up, light starts radiating from him. And then a voice from heaven affirms Jesus's identity as the beloved son of God. Now, back in the 1500s, there was a man named Copernicus who was a mathematician and astronomer. Now through like observation and study, he drew a model of the universe that was different than the popularly held model. But it was so radically different because it swapped out what was at the center. Now this popular model had the earth at the center of the universe with everything else rotating around it. Now Copernicus, however, he placed the sun at the center and dislodged the earth from the center of the universe. He ushered in what was known as the Copernican revolution, which fueled the minds of people like Galileo, Johannes Kepler, Isaac Newton, and the whole scientific revolution. Now the world was in uproar over the revolution because it dislodged not only what was at the center, but then everything else that orbited around it. Now you might be asking yourself, that's a pretty cool story, but what does this have to do with Transfiguration Sunday? Very good question, and I like good questions. Now the central belief we hold to will have enough gravity to make all other beliefs come into orbit around it and be subservient to it. So how is it that we've taken one of the most important moments in Christ's life and we know barely anything about it and what it means? This story probably has no impact upon what we have made central to our belief. So it flies off into a farther orbit in outer space 
and then makes an appearance as often as like Halley's Comet once every 80 years or so. So here's how that worked in my own personal life. My previous belief system had Good Friday as the central piece. Christ died for our sins so we could go to heaven and not have eternal damnation. Kind of that, that was the central understanding of my faith. Easter Sunday then is orbits around that. And it's just proof that Good Friday worked. See, didn't die, didn't stay dead. It was just evidence of Christ's divinity, right? Advent and Christmas are anticipations for promises of Good Friday, another orbiting factor. And the teaching of Christ is pretty neat for those advanced Christians who want to be uber spiritual, but we tend to go to the epistles of Paul for all of the teaching content because he talked about atonement and sacrifice and all that stuff. So where does the transfiguration fit into that system? Maybe some more proof that Jesus was God and therefore fit to take on the Good Friday story for, for my benefit? You see how when something is central like that, it dislodges everything else around it that doesn't seem as important. Now what happens when we have a Copernican revolution of theology? Oh, and the thing we thought was the center, Good Friday, was merely just a planet orbiting around something a little bit weightier, the entire life of Christ. Well, Transfiguration Sunday comes back into orbit in its proper place and then properly influences our understanding of God, our world, and ourselves. So let's hear this passage read to us and explore some of its meaning on the other side. We'll see you in a minute. Hi, this is Peyton, and I'm going to be doing the scripture reading for today. Um, it's Luke 9, 28 through 36. About eight days after Jesus said this, he took Peter, John, and James with him and went up onto the mountain to pray. As he was praying, the appearance of his face changed, and his clothes became as bright as a flash of lightning. Two men, Moses and Elijah, appeared in glorious splendor, talking with Jesus. They spoke about his departure, which he was about to bring to fulfillment at Jerusalem. Peter and his companions were very sleepy, but when they became fully awake, they saw his glory and the two men standing with him. As the men were leaving Jesus, Peter said to him, Master, it is good for us to be here. Let us put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He did not know what he was saying. While he was speaking, a cloud appeared and covered them, and they were afraid as they entered the cloud. A voice came from the cloud saying, This is my son whom I have chosen. Listen to him. When the voice had spoken, they found that Jesus was alone. The disciples kept this to themselves and did not tell anyone at the time what they had seen. We like shiny things, neatly packaged and conveniently at our disposal nowadays, right? Convenience can save us when we're exhausted and need something easy, like dinner out of a box on a crazy weeknight where there are so many activities that are pulling you in all these directions, right? That's a good thing, but it's also not meant to replace the act of planning, preparing, and eating food with people you love. This passage with shiny Jesus refuses to be packaged into a nice and tidy and convenient little message. I actually couldn't find consensus in the early church with the meaning of this passage. It's all over the place. I couldn't even find consensus between three accounts of the Gospels. Actually, you read Mark, and you read Matthew, and you read Luke, and they're all different. John doesn't even have it. So it seems as though each writer was doing something different with it, so I reached out to a pastoral hero of mine to help me, Father Kenneth Tanner from Holy Redeemer in Metro Detroit. Yes, Father Kenny is my homeboy, along with Thomas Merton. Now, this story is drenched in unapologetic symbolism from the central story of their faith, Moses leading the Hebrew people out of Egypt, and then into the wilderness, and then up to the Promised Land. How do we know? Well. Outside the fact that Moses is actually here, present in the story, the Greek word used uh, here is not the typical Greek word used to describe someone leaving when it says that they're describing his departure to Jerusalem. That's what the NIV has it. The word there that Luke uses to describe what Moses and Elijah and Jesus are actually talking about is the word exodus, which was he was about to accomplish in Jerusalem. And it's the singular use of this word in the entire New Testament. So to understand what's happening here, we need to understand what's happened there and the similarities between the two stories to see how Luke decentralizes a major belief system for them that brings a Copernican revolution to their understanding. Haha, <laughs> tie-in, see that? 
Now, the people of Jesus' day are awaiting the promised Messiah. And with that came a ton of expectations tied to what he was going to do. He's going to be a second Moses figure who would lead a second exodus by doing three things. Claim the throne, cleanse the temple, and defeat the Romans. These three acts are described as the redemption of Israel, which Luke opens up the story with. They were expecting a military uprising led by the Messiah and blessed by God. And that was the central point around which all other things rotated for them. The disciples can't wrap their heads around anything different. Even after the resurrection of Jesus in the book of Acts, they asked, so is this the time for you to restore Israel? Hint, hint, meaning are you now claiming the throne to lead the military uprising against Rome? But Jesus has an entirely different plan in mind. This is what he was talking about with Moses and Elijah, two heroes of their faith that represented the law and the prophets. The law of Moses could not accomplish a society free from violent oppression. And the prophetic voice of Elijah could not build a society of equity to the outsider, vulnerable and neglected. The two dreams of these two individuals. Now this new exodus that Jesus is about to lead brings the opportunity of epiphany. Individuals can wake up to the utter flaw in the entire system of violence. As biblical scholar Walter Wink said, the dominant religion on the planet is not Christianity, Islam, Hinduism, or Judaism, but the pervasive faith in violence. So this transfiguration moment is not about a new triumphalism that raises the oppressed into the position of oppressor, but Christ will deal with oppression altogether by defeating the fear humans have in their own death. This transfiguration is a picture of what is to come. All right, sleep is good. Humans need sleep. There is a culture in modern society that has discounted sleep as a need for weak people, while the strong only get like four hours of sleep and then go get things done. But they also die early deaths. So good sleep is a way of living that is to be celebrated. But there are times when sleeping can make you miss out on something cool. Now, a few years back, there was a full lunar eclipse, and I woke up in the middle of the night to watch the event at like 3 a.m. It was beautiful, and I am so glad that I didn't miss out on it. But I also went back to sleep afterwards and slept in a little bit. While sleep is good and a natural part of being human, sleep in the New Testament can be used as a metaphor. And in today's narrative that we just read, um, the disciples are heavy with sleep, but they fight through and stay awake and witness the shining glory of God in this moment. Now, sleep can be a metaphor for a state of an unawakened mind, heart, or soul. Luke, as he recounts this moment, includes this detail to make a narrative point to his audience. The temptation in an evil world, addicted to violence, oppression, and domination, is to participate in that world using its own methods and lose consciousness to the not widely accepted truth that love is the better way. This is the light that is shining forth from Jesus. Now, Father Kenneth Tanner, whom I emailed and asked for some help, he wrote on this, uh, and he said, here on the holy mountain, for a fleeting moment of eternal now, the disciples witnessed the glory of what Eastern Christians call the uncreated light that is waiting to be unveiled everywhere and in every ordinary thing in creation. The light of resurrection. This uncreated light reveals not the color, shape, size, and texture of a thing or a person as natural light does. No, this uncreated light discloses the goodness, beauty, and verity instilled in the tree or in the tiger, or the orchid, or the human, by God. This unique illumination, unavailable apart from self-sacrificial love, and not revealed apart from the cross, is made possible by the profound humility of humanity's incarnate God. I love Father Kinney. That picture of the humble human God in Christ who walks the path of self-sacrificial love perfectly, even through death, defeating it, and sharing the resurrection life with all creation. And this light emanating from Jesus is hidden inside all created things. When we are awake to that fact, we can live the path of self-sacrificial love without fear. But sleepiness presses in on us every day when we see the news of more violence, hatred, tragedy, war. Christ is not all Pollyanna about human evil and suffering. He will walk down the entire road. 
of the whole human experience, including violence and hatred, judgment and betrayal, suffering and death. Perhaps the dwellings the disciples want to make are so that they can bypass this road and prolong this one moment, but that cannot be. Christ will overcome it all with the power of love. Now, Father Kenny also said, we spend a lot of time in the church teaching folks how to live well in this world on its terms and by its means, while we should teach humans how to live in this world on the terms and by the means of the world that is in the end coming to this world. For example, we adopt a spiritualized version of how the fittest succeed, doing so Christianly, quote, if you will, forgetting that the weaknesses that the weakness of God on the cross is the energy that powers all stars, that keeps all things in motion, and that gives breath to every living thing. See, this transfiguration event reveals the hidden end that love takes us to, if we can just stay awake. You think seeing is believing, right? That's a very popular phrase. But many people see the same event and then interpret it very differently. You can see it in the popular news commentary shows that dominate our media world. Just pick your polarity and then ingest every word, every idea, every spin. And it all stems from the same event, the same reality. So seeing isn't always believing, hearing is. We see an event take place and then look to someone to help us interpret the situation so that we can believe something out of it. We all do it. We witness what is going on in the world, and then we ask people that we admire and respect, well, what do you think about, and then insert the topic of our day. Hence me emailing Father Kenny. Hey, what do you think about transfiguration? Help me out here. You see, we need commentary, but when those commentaries cross lines, look out. So it is helpful that God provides the commentary for the disciples here. Who knows how they would have interpreted this situation? The popular theological framework embraced at the time had a God who favored one people group over another and then was going to bless that people group so that they could go and annihilate any other people groups that opposed them. For to oppose them is to oppose God's blessing, God's will, God's desire, and God himself. And as Anne Lamott has famously said, and I've quoted a few times here, you can safely assume you've created God in your own image when it turns out that God hates all the same people that you do. This is why their God, when incarnated in the person of Christ, was crucified for blasphemy and treason. God did not support their narrative, so they killed him. And this is what humans tend to do. Now the disciples see the glory of Christ shine right there before them on the mountain. But then they become blinded by a cloud it's a popular belief that an encounter with God is going to bring clarity, direction, assurance, confidence, you know, certainty. How many times are we, quote, waiting for God to speak or, quote, waiting for God to give us some direction? But an encounter with God is an encounter with truth. And this truth can feel like darkness when it does not support our current understanding or our current narratives. Sometimes that truth brings confusion and fear because it's so foreign to what we currently know or value or understand. It is a truth that cannot be wielded as a weapon. For as Rowan Williams said, truth makes love possible. Love makes truth bearable. The truth revealed in the cloud of darkness only says, this is my son, the chosen one, listen to him. Okay, so what has he said thus far that they're supposed to listen to and take heed of? Well, he said, but I say to you that listen, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, pray for those who abuse you, do to others as you would have them do to you, be merciful just as your Father in heaven is merciful. Now this is a really tedious, boring, messy, confusing path that Jesus walks down and then turns around and says, follow me. Maybe this is why their response is just silence here. Maybe this is why they didn't tell anyone what happened for a long time. Maybe their dreams of domination are slowly being dismantled brick by brick, just like their temple will be dismantled in 70 AD brick by brick, leaving them with no religious system to promote or protect, only one another to love and live in this way that Jesus said. 
So our benediction today is a blessing for such a journey, away from the dazzling clarity of seeing Jesus's glory, and then down the mountain and back into the world to love our fellow humans, knowing that somewhere deep in them, a light is there. And somewhere deep within us, a light is there. And the place of love is possible because of this shared light. So let's hear our benediction read, and we'll see you next week. And now for a blessing. This one's called Dazzling, a blessing for Transfiguration Sunday. Believe me, I know how tempting it is to remain inside this blessing, to linger where everything is dazzling and clear. We could build walls around this blessing, put a roof over it. We could bring in table, chairs, have the most amazing meals. We could make a home. We could stay. But this blessing is built for leaving. This blessing is made for coming down the mountain. This blessing wants to be in motion, to travel with you as you return to level ground. It will seem strange how quiet this blessing becomes when it returns to earth. It is not shy. It is not afraid. It simply knows how to bide its time to watch and wait, to discern and pray until the moment comes when it will reveal everything it knows. When it will shine forth with all it has seen, when it will dazzle with the unforgettable light you have carried all this way. By Jan Richardson. Thank you so much for joining us online today. We hope this service has been a blessing to you. What now? One, participate. If you'd like to participate in our services, we would welcome your readings with a simple phone recording. Two, partner. If you'd like to give financially to ensure the continuation of this online service, there is a link at the bottom of your screen. And three, subscribe. You may subscribe on YouTube or like our page on Facebook to stay updated with our online services. We hope you have found some hope, help, and healing today. See you next week. Shiny Jesus. Shiny Jesus. We like shiny things. Neatly packaged and convenient. Convenient. Let's try that again. Okay, shiny, happy Jesus. We like shiny things. Neatly packaged and convenient. It's bright out here with the snow glaring. Packaged, Jesus.